In a previous century, I heard a uh, sociology professor from Eastern State University, Tony Campolo, re-preach what he called his senior pastor's sermon. And I thought he did real well until I heard the original. You can hear both on YouTube. But uh, he was preaching Dr. S.M. Lockridge's famous sermon, It's Friday. And as much as I enjoyed Tony's preaching of it, uh, the original was just so much more powerful. It's Friday, Dr. Lockridge would say. And then he would come up with something that was going on on Friday. It's Friday. Pilate is washing his hands. It's Friday. Satan is laughing. It's Friday. And on and on he would go. But every now and then he would offer a slightly different refrain. He would say, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Today's message is a bit opposite of that. Uh, That was a Good Friday message telling us no matter how bad things got, and things get pretty bad on Good Friday, that Easter Sunday's coming. It's the promise of the resurrection, the promise of what God in Christ Jesus will do. But now today, we got a glimpse of Sunday. It's a glimpse of Jesus and His resurrected glory, but it's done so knowing that Friday's coming, that the glory comes through the cross. And that is the message today we read from Dr. Luke in chapter 9, verse 28 and following. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with Him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while He was praying... The appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When he had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. The one thing that I get most out of today's initial reading is that what happened happened because of prayer. In Dr. Luke's gospel, more than any place else, you see how important prayer, that connection to the Father is for Jesus in daily life. It was while he was praying that he started glowing. Now, Mark's gospel is the oldest of the four gospels. And you have in Mark's gospels in chapter 9 a telling of this that Luke uses to base his story on, but he drops off certain things. For example, in the oldest version, it talks about his clothing being white, brighter than anyone on earth could possibly bleach them. Luke realized that was coming across wrong because he drops the idea of clothing glowing because he knows it wasn't the clothing that glue glowed. Glue? 
glowed. It was the person inside the clothing, and the clothing was just letting the glowing out. And it happens because of prayer. It's not the mountain, it's not the location, it's the prayer life. In Luke's Gospel, when Jesus is baptized, do you remember the Holy Spirit comes down? But in Luke's Gospel, it's not, the text says, while he was praying, the Holy Spirit comes down. It's not the baptism, it's the prayer after the baptism. When Jesus goes and selects his disciples in Luke's Gospel, all night long beforehand, he spends the night in prayer. And then he makes the important decision about who is going to lead the church after he departs. Everything that happens in Luke's Gospel of any type of importance, you'll always see that Jesus is praying. So if you get nothing else from today's text, understand that it's your prayer life that causes you to be like Jesus. Because it was Jesus' prayer life that connected him to the Father. And the glowing is only, is only this understanding of God's presence, the glory at work. Now, I did promise you that it was Sunday and Friday's coming. And looking at this text, you might ask yourself, well, where does Earl get that? Before I show you, I want to remind you that we didn't divide up the Bible into chapters until around the 12th century. We didn't divide the Bible up into verses until around the 14th century. And so what we heard, disjointed as it is by separation into chapters and verses, as it was originally written, as it was heard for the first millennia and over, was all read together. Back in the previous chapter, you have Simon Peter acknowledging that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus in 21 explains what it is for the Son of Man to be the Messiah, to undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed on the third day, be raised. And he goes on and, and talks about the followers lose your life, save it, save your life, lose it. But at 27, but truly I tell you there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter, James, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Who is it that got to see? It's Peter, James and John. They get to see the kingdom of God. This is the image. And, and, and just in case that sounds too weak, let's consider on the eighth day. Now what did I say was the oldest of the four Gospels? Mark. Mark tells this story on the sixth day. Luke tells it later about the eighth day. Is Luke just bad at math? I mean, in a very general sense, six is about eight. I wouldn't want that person doing my taxes. But, you know, it's about eight. But what's his point? You may remember from some weeks ago when we were talking about John chapter 2, water into wine. John 1, three verses begin the next day, the next day, the next day. John 2, verse 1, on the third day. You're thinking, my goodness, it's rampant, this bad math. But I explained that no, John is pointing out that the event itself is a third day event. It's a third day, it's a resurrection story. Well, this is on the eighth day, and Luke intentionally changes the numbering to make a point. It's an eighth day story. Now, if the Sabbath is the seventh day, Saturday, what day is the eighth day? 
Resurrection day. This is a resurrection story. It's people not tasting death before they actually see visually with their own two little eyes the kingdom of God. And it's Jesus here, and he glows. And it's not coming from his clothing. Luke wants you to understand. Now, Mark understood that point, but the way he expressed it could be misunderstood. Luke takes out any misunderstanding. He drops the idea of clothing glowing altogether. He says it's Jesus. But it's not only Jesus glowing. You've got Moses. You've got Elijah showing up. Now, you might wonder, why are they there? As Dr. Luke tells this story, it brings to memory another text from Hebrew Scripture, Exodus 24, at verse 15 following. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now, what day is ours? You heard six and seven, our days on the eighth day. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Guess what? Moses is on that mountain too with Jesus. They talk about something, and Luke's the only one that gets to recount what they talk about. They talk about what my translation says, Jesus' departure which he was about to accomplish. Have you ever talked about a departure as being an accomplishment? <clears throat> departure in the original Greek is a different word. It's exodus. It's exodus. Jesus is being presented here as a new Moses, giving the people of God a, a new exodus, a new freedom, uh, a relief from the old way a new life altogether. No longer slaves to sin and death. This new Moses has come to complete what the first Moses failed to do. You remember Moses actually didn't make it into the promised land. At least, at least not then. Moses got to look over into the promised land. But now it's Moses and Elijah. Elijah, by the way, also failed. You remember he got scared of uh, Jezebel and ran. And when God found him and got him quietened down, he told him to go anoint uh, Elisha. Couldn't think of the name there for a second. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, and a waste is a terrible thing to mind. Elijah was told, you go anoint Elisha as prophet of Israel. And you're thinking, but that's his job. Well, yeah, he lost his job because he ran in fear. So you got two failures come to speak to one who is now to lead to success. What's the point? Moses is the great lawgiver. He came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Elijah is the greatest of the prophets the one who speaks for God, and the people listen. And we're told that the one who gave the law and the greatest of the prophets come to Jesus, but when it's all said and done, they're gone, and only Jesus is left behind. The law and the prophets are fulfilled in Jesus. That's the message. Any religion, any faith, that doesn't have Jesus at its core, at the very center, is not the Christian faith. This is the message today. Jesus has to be center. Yes, the law can lead you to Jesus. Yes, prophets can lead you to Jesus. But when it's all said and done, when the Father has spoken, we're left with Christ alone. And the three... Peter, John, James get to see this with their own eyes. They hear the message. They understand it's the Father's will. All of this from the very beginning back 
to Exodus and before him was always the Father's will. Jesus is the chosen one to be Savior. That this is the plan and it's accomplished by his departure, his exodus, the cross. And in the cross, you and I have freedom. Now, Peter does something that makes him my favorite prophet. He is the apostle of the impetuous. He just, he rushes in where angels fear to tread. Jesus, it's good for us to stay here. Let's build a holiday inn up on this mountain and give room for you and, and Moses and Elijah. You, you forget there's three others, Peter and John and James. I mean, they're going to sleep out in the woods or something. I don't know. And the Father shows up. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Even the Father points to Jesus. The law, the prophets, the Father himself. This is my plan. This is my way. But it doesn't end there. They don't stay on the mountain. Simon wants to stay on the mountain. I've wanted to stay on mountaintop experiences. I've had experiences of God and I've wanted to stay there and camp out there. And God's will is go on down into the valley. That's where ministry is done. Yes, yes, you get great revelation up on that mountaintop. Yes, you get the very presence of God. You may even glow. But it's down in the valley where you do the work. It's Sunday. But Friday's coming. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. On page 12 in our hymnal, we have our service. I want to make it clear that you do not have to be a member of this congregation or of this denomination to come. The table is set. The physical body of Jesus, the church, has set the table, but it's Christ who invites. And if you would receive what Christ offers at this table, you're welcome. Hear this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved You with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us stand, offer one another signs of reconciliation and love.